everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hot La Mode. And today on Hot La Mode, we are coming to you with day two of our oat couture reviews for spring summer 2021. So let's get into it. Virginie Viard Chanel is a constant question mark in my mind. While it's constantly said that clothing sales are up at the company, which for Chanel is great, I don't think the collections actually say anything. And for some designers, selling clothing is just enough. But Chanel is a heritage brand. It has stories, legacy, and a lot to offer, but season after season, it seems that all we get are just clothes and not much else. And maybe if we were getting constantly beautiful clothing I could make an exception, but I personally don't feel that the clothing is even thoughtful. Even though Virginie was inspired by weddings and family gatherings, I think we need more. The collection opened with a white lace top that is sweet, whose cuffs are adorned with little red flowers which play into the maxi skirt attached. Bohemia is a trope many designers have looked into as the escape to the countryside has left many cities more empty than usual. And while I'm sure a lot of work went into this shiny red floral skirt, the slit up the middle and and it's just lack of interest in terms of cut makes it feel very flat. Virginie's love of tweed on skin is a defining styling trope of her Chanel collections. And I do think that sometimes it can actually be really youthful and fun. Here, a vest top wants to mix the casual and professional between the buttons and tweed, as well as the fact the top is cut into a tank top style. I can see her trying to speak to a customer stuck at home. If customers love it, I'll eat crow, but it's just not very very enjoyable to look at though. Jill Cordelev is the first plus size model we have seen on a Chanel runway in a while. She's donning a red and white tweed cardigan coat with black piping, which in terms of garments is a style we have seen time and time again from the brand. But I do find it odd that the one plus size model has been given a garment that covers her entire body up. As we said during our Scaparelli review last video, this might not be intentional, but it does send a subtle message to plus size customers. Maybe having more than one token plus size model on the runway could be the next step for Chanel. A black tweed dress flecked with gold specks is sweet and the layered tool skirt is exciting. Maybe exciting is dramatic, but it's the first look that's made me feel something other than disdain. It almost looks like the skirt is not complete and rather a belt that might be transferable to other garments, which for Chanel customers might be a fun way to dress up their pieces from previous season. Sustainability. I respect Virginie's want to dress real women. I didn't always, but now I do. This feels like a smart way for customers to get more bang for their buck, and styles like these should be more common on the Chanel runways. A silver tweed skirt suit is really difficult to comprehend. The jacket is boxy yet curves in at the hem, giving it a less than desirable shape. The yellow silk shirt underneath is hideous, but does coincide with the yellow undertones in the jacket and skirt. As for the skirt, I think it's the worst part. It seems like it wants to help, but it's trying and failing to accentuate the hips, and rather is just creating a hideous line that no one with more than four brain cells would pay $20,000 for. Our red flowers are back, and this time in an interesting top. A collar and frilled bib, as well as flaps that fall from the shoulders to the bust area, feels like a more dressed up shirt. I won't say it's major or revolutionary, but it's just interesting. Simple tweed sets in pink and green appear, and I believe they are attempts at trying to modernize tweeds. We have heard in videos previously that tweed can come off as a very old fabric, and some Chanel clients feel that it ages them. But tweed is also a fabric so synonymous with the house that it can't be dropped. So in my opinion, it's every Chanel creative director's job to make tweed modern and desirable through new cuts, techniques, or evolutions of fabrics. Virginie here is trying to make it something that is very casual but it still feels almost too formal. I must say, I think she is on the right track in this endeavor, and when she cracks the code, I'll be the first one to give her a standing ovation. A lot of Virginie's Chanel feels very serious. There is a lack of fantasy oftentimes, which is pushed aside for the more practical pieces, which again is okay. That's her mission statement, but when we do get more fun and creative styles like this sequin cocktail dress with tulle loofah on the butt, I can at least tell she's trying to evoke a bit of joy. It doesn't evoke any joy in me, so I hope that she'll realize going bigger, brasher, and bolder with garments like these is the way to do it. Something about this next tweed dress makes me feel that this is another attempt at modernizing tweed. We have been seeing prairie dresses hit the runways for a while and then trickle into the mainstream too. Here, I think Virginie wants to channel that energy in the brand's signature. And I think it works if that's the true intent. It's big, it's ridiculous, it's poofy, it's dramatic, you know, it's 
fun. The white button down shirt with big ball gown skirt is never going to work. I don't know who needs to hear this a million times. It's not going to happen. I'm sorry, but it's not. It's especially not going to work when it looks like old tablecloths were cut into strips and layered to make hideous tears. I think Chanel could actually stand to experiment in the world of upcycling, but this is not the direction I think it should go in. A streamlined pink tweed set is an exciting but definitely wearable and has a more youthful feel. And a bedazzled slouchy jacket, white collarless shirt, and gray tweed slacks are just unfun. I mean, the collarless jacket is a nice ode to Coco Chanel, and I can appreciate the pant side stripe is of the same shimmer as the jacket, but overall it's just you're doing a good job of making it really depressing. A black skirt set is lovely. It feels like a little black dress cut in half, but also possibly shaved to create that motif. This is also a great time to point out the dainty aspect of Virginie's accessories. Here, the usually gauche and loud Chanel gold belt is subtle and whispers elegance and the heritage of the house. It's a really nice touch seen throughout the whole collection. I think lockdowns are making me soft. A lovely pink and creamsicle orange dress arrives and is a floaty and pretty dress that customers who are obsessed with everything pink and sparkly will probably enjoy. It's kind of perfect for mood boards about Paris. And tears are common in Chanel collections, and usually they are very hard to appreciate, but this dress deserves its roses. Or camellias or whatever flower is on this. And you can tell it's haute couture because of those gorgeous flowers that pipe the bust, straps, and waist. This is a good look, solid, strong Virginie, strong. The most exciting look of the show was this white sheer net dress. The silhouette is old world and reminiscent of debutante ball gowns that found inspiration in the panniers of the robe a la Française. The fact that you can see the model's breasts underneath does seem like an interesting aspect of Virginie's construction choices. Instead of styling the pieces with no shirt underneath, it's been constructed to showcase the bust. I presume clients interested will want it lined with an opaque fabric, or maybe not, which, you know, I'm kind of living for. But more dresses that have pizzazz and flair and drama like this would be appreciated, Virginie. To be completely honest, I think the cut of this tweed suit is different. It's definitely cut in a more professional style, yet the black scalloped feather appliques are confusing. I understand wanting to add an element that showcases the atelier's craftsmanship, but couldn't it have actually accentuated the suit rather than detracted from it? A silky white button-down shirt is oddly paired with a bouffant black tulle skirt. It's moments like these that drive me nuts. Where is this wearable? What is the reason behind the styling? Who do we actually think would wear this? Why do we think that they would actually wear this? Where do we think we could actually wear this? How do we think it could actually wear this? Those are my five W's and the H of who, what, when, where, why, and how. A multicolored floral ensemble consists of an opaque dress and lace underskirt, but it looks more like something you'd fish out of your dead kooky aunt's closet when you're cleaning out her house rather than a full look on a Chanel haute couture runway. I just, I wanna die. Like nothing about this skirt is right. We are two for four when it comes to tiered skirts this season, which is probably a higher average than previous outings, but Still poor, 50%, failing, not good. It's like when NBA players miss their free throws. This is what you are paid billions of dollars to do. What is going on? Then a ball gown is covered in floral motifs or embroidery, I'm not really sure which it is, but it's sweet. I do think Virginie can make cutesy little looks like this so well, and I almost wish she would explore a whole collection in a style like this sometime soon. Maybe a Chanel Cruise collection in Tokyo could give us a real dose of kawaii energy we all deserve. A netting motif appears in a sheer over the torso. What did I tell you about Virginie's love of exposing that area? Tool is knotted from six different directions, creating a segue between the skirt and the top, which is appreciable. It's not miraculous, but could become a style to explore more in the future. A light blue tulle skirt is paired with a vest that uses a pearl belt to cinch the waist. Underneath the vest, we can see a see-through cage-like top in the same icy blue. It's actually really lovely, and I think with something besides this vest, it could actually be a real standout look. A black tiered gown with gold latticework reminds me of a Métier de Arc collection motif we saw at the last Chanel shop. You can watch our video about it if you missed it. It definitely was the better of the two, but nice to see Virginie retaking on a motif. A dress made up of sheer daisies is actually pretty sweet. And the daisies make up the entire dress, which allows it to be a thorough garment that is 100% dedicated to its cause. I'm almost relieved to see that Virginie might have heeded my advice from a few reviews ago, where a hope for exploring other flowers besides the Chanel Camellia was mentioned. I'm not gonna take full credit for it, but like, you know, in my head I am. Whether or not she actually listened to me, 
what you did. I think this style proves that breaking out of brand norms can sometimes be a good thing. Although it's late in the game, the white fishnets are actually a really lovely takeoff from last collection's tights. Tights can be right, like it's it's possible. The fact that the daisy dress is really a cocktail dress with a wraparound train that creates a high-low effect is also pretty enjoyable. Overall, very solid, strong look for Virginie. Maybe Virginie is a staunch supporter of the free the nipple movement, we just didn't know about it. Which I am here for, to be honest, as a black sheer dress exposes the torso and part of the breast. Layered chiffon covers the majority of the breasts, though, and would be lovely if it wasn't for this bow right here. I'm not obsessed with the tear skirt, but I do think that it makes the look a tad more dramatic. Most couture collections end with a wedding dress. It's just a tradition that many houses carry on from the early days of haute couture shows. Virginie's is a beautiful satin floor length coat gown with full sleeves, popped collar, and trumpet cut. Embroidered beaded motifs of butterflies covers the gown, which is sweet and I'm sure can be turned into any kind of motif depending on what the client wants. The embroidered veil train is just the cherry on top. Virginie's Chanel collection was fine. Not any worse than previous ones and more and more her identity is coming through. But I do think the lack of models of color and the one plus size model is quite off-putting. Let's be honest, there's still a lot of work to be done over at the House of Chanel to really truly modernize it. Next up, Valentina. Pierpaolo Piccioli's Spring 2021 Valentina Haute Couture collection was almost a religious experience. The collection was dubbed, quote, code temporal and explored the, quote, rituals, process, and values of couture, and what couture means and how it's timeless. To me, this collection felt like a continuation of a narrative Pierpaolo has already been weaving since his last Haute Couture collection. You can watch our video about it for context, but it was stark and white and such a 180 from the colorful and bright Valentino we have seen for years now. To me, it was Pierpaolo reacting to the world of COVID shutdowns and the lack of ability to live life like we had. It seems like Pierpaolo was wiping the slate clean and looking at a blank canvas. This season feels like it's taking a cautious step into the radiant world of Valentino that we once knew. The collection begins with a white wool cape that is made up of squares braided together, which is a style Pierpaolo showed us during his fall 2019 couture collection. It's perforated, allowing a fuchsia top and pant to shine from underneath. And even from the first look, Pierpaolo shows us that this collection is a stepping stone from this stark world we saw last season. Is the color bubbling below this white cape trying to show us that while on the outside this world we are living in is really sterile, but the excitement and exuberance and drama and personality and culture is still there underneath, just suppressed. A fuchsia trench coat with a taupe top and brown skirt follows and the model eventually pulls the coat off and drags it on the floor. I guess this does make me wonder whether rich people throw their haute couture around the house the way that I throw my own clothes around the house. Anybody that knows about these things, please let me know. I would love to hear. We should also note the shoes, which are ridiculous chrome platform heels. And something tells me Pierre Paolo was listening to a lot of Chromatica when designing this collection. Who knew that he was a little monster? A slinky dress has a skirt and deconstructed top in brown. The latter exposes an ivory top underneath and allows the brown to hang over it. I think it's nice to see the earth tones in white paired with another bright fuchsia style, but the dress doesn't give the desired effect. Unfortunately, I won't be talking about menswear in this video, but if I have time, may add it into the upcoming men's fashion week video if you guys really wanna see it. A gorgeous oversized taupe wool blazer and short has a neon pink undershirt and silver chrome boot. Many found this Valentino collection to be exceedingly simple, but haute couture is really made to measure clothing. And while the drama and pomp and circumstance is what many are drawn to, brands right now are trying to not lose any more money. So making clothing that's actually wearable is probably more on their mind than, you know, marketing fodder. This suit feels like it could actually be purchased by clients. Maybe it's a bit more tailored for some, or just this baggy fit for those looking to slowly transition out of the comfortable sweats we've all been wearing for the past 10 months. And note the continuation of neutral styles with subtle nods of bright colors. That's something we're just gonna be talking about again and again and again, because that is what this collection is. 
A blush pink trench coat has a brown knit turtleneck underneath and is again something that feels attainable. Feels is the optimum word here as it's probably made from fabric that I'd have to sell a kidney to afford and it would be handcrafted by a group of artisans which would make it haute couture level expensive. Still, just because a garment isn't full of embellishments or has a ball gown skirt doesn't mean it isn't haute couture. If it's handmade and custom fit to you, that might make it worth the price for those able to afford Afford it. I also must say that while there isn't much punchy extravagant color going on here, the silhouette of this trench coat does have a real grandeur about it. A beige top is paired with a blue pink ball gown skirt and the idea of vibrancy bubbling up to the surface comes in a fuchsia tulle underskirt that makes itself visible even though it's literally underneath the whole skirt. Then a top emerges full of pink metallic flowers that swing as the model struts down the runway. On top of that an oversized pair of shorts is paired with a pink chrome pair of thigh-high platform boots. After so many looks that cautiously use color or even suppress it, here is a burst of joy that takes form in fashion. The more I think about this collection, the more I realize that this collection really is about a slow return to normal. It's just Valentino's normal. Along the journey, there has been a lot of hardship, more for some than others, but as the light at the end of the tunnel gets brighter, exciting moments give us happiness and hope, almost like the pacing of this look within the show. A beautifully cut off the shoulder pink dress coat is opened by the model, which then falls symmetrically. Lots has been learned throughout this COVID experience, and I think it's being put into practice. Models being more than just flesh covered hangers brings excitement to the runway. And this feels like a small step to more models getting to be an equal part of telling a designer's story and selling the excuse my French, motherfucking garment, which is very important. Also, the undisputed accessories of the season go to the Valentino platforms. This pair seems like it's been touched by King Midas and honestly, I am obsessed. Throughout the collection, there are a lot of simple looks, but not all of them work. This dress's silhouette isn't flattering and the attached cape feels like an afterthought rather than a real aspect of the dress. The silver chrome boots though, they can stay. While some simple looks are rough, others are so clean that you get a sense of relief after viewing them, like this ivory silk shirt and skirt. The shirt is baggy, again something I think will be reassuring for customers, while the turtleneck and skirt underneath fortify that columnal silhouette Pier Paolo favors. A camel wool coat covers a brown top, chartreuse turtleneck, and taupe skirt. As the model reaches the end of the grand hallway, she begins to remove the coat, showing that it has been slit up the sides. It's almost like a tunic coat of some sort, and I'm interested to see whether or not clients are drawn to it. A chartreuse rib knit sweater dress emerges, and again, its boldness comes from the color rather than silhouette. Also, after a slew of pretty subdued looks, a pop of color rears its loud little head and I'm happy about it. Full bodysuits made of sequins are something we saw during the fall 2020 couture collection, but solely in silver. Here, a gold bodysuit doesn't just create texture through the countless sequins, but above the sternum and the sides of the thighs, it looks like they're ruffled or twisted or turned. The torso section feels more refined as it must be complicated to create such a texture without adding extra fabric on top. The side panels are a little bit less stunning though as it toes the line of looking like dead skin covered in gold glitter. We must note the simple white wool coat over top though. Again, we are back on the color blocking defense and I don't mean color blocking of like color blocking. I mean, we're blocking the colors from being seen. An ombre of sequins goes from white to silver, touching on last season's dueling colors, but unfortunately falls flat here. The perforated techniques come back in what look like interlocking circles rather than squares and take form in a coat. A brown sweater and brick pant underneath give us reassurances that earth tones are here to stay at Valentino, or at least we can hope. A neon green slinky dress is asymmetrically draped, but does add taupe gloves and gold platforms to center it. As the collection goes on, the Valentino of pre COVID continues to bubble up as a neon green princess cut ball gown emerges. Valentino is not a brand known for deconstruction, but it is a brand known for its craftsmanship. So being able to actually see the stitches of this dress and having these support pipes outwardly shape this gown is really interesting. And a departure from the almost perfect nature of Valentino construction. Here Paolo often shows us behind the scenes views of the atelier's craftspeople that work on these Valentino collections. Even naming those who worked on individual pieces in this collection video. So maybe this is a nod to showing the inside of a couture house, which is not usually the norm. 
A light green sweater vest is paired with a gigantic brown taffeta skirt, and it's pretty ridiculous, not gonna lie. But I think this all stems back to the cautious wading back into the shallow end of couture. To show all bodacious gowns when many are stuck at home would almost seem like a counterintuitive act for a brand. While many hope that big events and balls and galas will be back by 2021, it's not something we can be assured of. So showing a slouchy sweater, which one can don on their next Zoom call, with a big skirt that they can dream about might be the best of both worlds. A lilac top that resembles a sweater but made out of some sort of sequins is paired with a perforated yellow square skirt. Miraculous colors are starting to be paired up again and I'm feeling very excited that the future of Valentino will be colorful once more. A beautifully cut white mohair caftan has a thin but plunging neckline, as well as a gorgeous high-low cape. Underneath is a neon orange sweater and orange pant, and again, we see the way the styling is pushing this consistent messaging of suppression of color, of excitement, of joy, but it's still there. A gorgeous orange coat is paired over a white top and wine-colored oversized shorts. Now, I think something else that we should discuss is how haute couture is being fitted during the pandemic. So in order to be considered haute couture by the Fédération de la haute couture, and for those that don't know, that is the governing body that determines what is or isn't haute couture, you must have a client do at least three fittings. Considering many countries have travel restrictions in place, not many clients can fly to Italy or Paris, and not many atelier craftspeople can run all around the globe to do fittings in person. So are these more relatable garments like sweaters, coats, and pants a way for Valentino to still provide gorgeous clothing without the rigorous fitting requirements? A custom fit ball gown is much harder to get right over Zoom rather than a fit of an oversized coat. And if that's the case, I think it's kind of brilliant. An orange jacket with bodacious puff sleeves is bold both in color and silhouette. Another joyous break from the muted selection we keep seeing. An almost all white look of coat, button down, and pants showcases a now suppressed red sequin turtleneck underneath. Valentino Rosso, the brand's famous red, finally makes its way into the collection. A gray mohair slouchy sweater is miraculous. It's so big it falls off the model's shoulder, exposing a salmony pink shirt underneath. For selfish reasons, this is my favorite look of the collection. Pierpaolo proves that at-home clothing doesn't have to be just sweats throughout this entire collection, and this is a look that would sell me on that notion wholeheartedly. More oversized styles, this time a brown sleeveless blazer, is paired over skirt and top and paired with an exciting orange glove and gold knee-high boot. I guess it's a good example of even mundane pieces being able to be exciting with the right accessories. A gigantic orange ball gown skirt again gives us the fan and drama we love in a Valentino collection, and is paired with a simple white tank top, which brings us back into the real world. Looks like these are a great example of the dichotomy of a life we lived and a life we live now. A gray sweater is full of embroidery that creates a squiggly motif. It's tiny, but upon closer inspection, it's easy to realize just how much handiwork has gone into it. We should also note that the bottom ribs and the cuffs of the sweater are embellished with crystals as well, which is an interesting development on the normally tight and unadorned aspects of these kinds of sweaters. A pair of white drawstring shorts, again, are probably easier for clients to be fitted in, but the real excitement in this look comes from that strange stole. I don't really understand how it's staying put on the model's body, but the way that it turns in on itself to create this stiff, curly texture is very, very, very amazing. A camel blazer that must be slid up the sides as the model's arms peek out underneath the sleeves is paired with a drawstring short, and of course a light blue shirt pops out from underneath. Then a gown of blue has a simple yet sophisticated high-low cape. Gowns like these don't need to be in bouffant silhouettes or full of encrusted jewels to be breathtaking. A white jacket and side slit skirt is lined in blue, once again playing on this notion of hidden colors that are becoming more and more visible, and they beautifully play off the icy blue turtleneck underneath as well. Lots of designers are creating more wearable garments now, as it helps to not bleed money, and usually the looks are kind of lackluster. But that doesn't seem to be the case of Valentino. This jacket has such sharp lines, yet feels soft at the same time, and something about the simplicity here is well thought through and not just 
basic. A pink glitter dress is sparkly and does feel like a call back to last season's silver sequins, but its ruffled neckline and simplicity aren't as exciting as the rest of the looks from this collection. A slouchy sweater vest exposes a white gown underneath, here reversing the idea of hiding color and instead starting to hide the stark white we've become accustomed to. Is this pure pallor reassuring us that we're getting even closer to that light at the end of the tunnel? A yellow wool cropped stole coat is quite interesting and we can see a white tank top underneath it, which strengthens the argument that we are getting closer to a return to normalcy, at least in this Valentino collection. The strangest yellow sweater I've ever seen emerges, and I'm obsessed with the way it distorts what we would consider a normal body. The pinkish taupe gloves and white skirt centers the look as well. Extravagance re-emerges with a full yellow ensemble covered by a gold confetti coat. It's bold, it's brash, it's ready to party, like many humans will be after lockdowns have stopped and it's safe to return to the world. I won't say the next look is anything groundbreaking, but this silver net dress filled with embellished pearls and larger pearl torso overlay and hood definitely ties us back into last season. It's a feat of craftsmanship for sure, but in general it's just a bit meh. Two shimmery glittery gowns emerge in silver and gold. They're not bad, but definitely not as exciting as they could have been. But I think this glitter is really here to signify that this horror will eventually come to an end and we can celebrate. Even in dark times, creativity can still bloom. A copper sequin bandeau and ball gown skirt complete the collection in another attempt to uplift the Valentino customers and audience. Again, not revolutionary, but it does follow this idea that a bright and sparkly age will come after these really, really hard times. According to a quote I found on Google, which this is alleged, he once said, fashion is the mirror of history. And no matter who said it, if he did actually say it or he didn't, it still holds true. Not many designers have been able to capture what is happening in our world very well. Many, it seems, are blindly unaware of the gravity of the situation or refuse to acknowledge it because it's easier to make your rich clients feel happy rather than sad. But Pier Paolo Pacioli last season and this season has refused to do that. Last season, he made a statement by making Valentino Orcuture a blank canvas. This season, he no longer lives in that sterile world. Rather, he is slowly working his way back into it just like we all are. Some countries have been able to lift COVID-19 lockdowns, others haven't. This collection shows the stark whiteness from last season and equates it with those of us still living under these conditions. And at the same time, he looks at the places that have been able to return to normalcy and equates them with the bright pops of color and sparkle in my opinion. This collection is cautiously showing us that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and I'll stop saying light at the end of the tunnel now, but we just have to be smart about the last lap in this long and very hard race. And if we are smart, we might be able to shine as bright as the sequins on that finale gown. If any fashion house is a mirror of history right now, it's Valentino. Let's face the final frontier of this haute couture season, Fendi. Kim Jones went on to do his first Fendi collection, and it was, in all fairness, underwhelming. Underwhelming doesn't necessarily equal bad, but it doesn't equal success either. The menswear favorite wanted to explore the timeline of Fendi, and through the found inspiration of Virginia Woolf's Orlando, there was this mixing and matching of, you know, time and menswear and womenswear. Uh. And on top of that, a star-studded cast of models definitely got the social media sphere going, but the clothing evidently didn't. So the collection started off with a black off-the-shoulder top incorporating elements of menswear, which means that menswear and tailoring elements from his famed men's collections for Dior will probably be carried over into Kim Jones's Fendi women's wear. And while that makes a lot of sense, it doesn't mean it looks good. The singular set of double-breasted buttons looks like they are holding on for dear life. I understand to get this off-the-shoulder effect, a cut like this is necessary, but it looks poorly done, which old couture should never look. The pants fit fine and a clutch that looks like a book is carried by the model as well. This look is our first introduction to Kim Jones's Fendi and it's bland, banal, and shows nothing of interest. So, exciting. 
Spring 2021 is a strange season for Fendi to do a show to me. Fendi Haute Couture, which I believe is really haute fure, essentially meaning high fur, only started being shown during the fall Haute Couture season back in 2015. And Karl Lagerfeld was so busy that he only showed every fall season, which for a traditionally fur house, makes a lot of sense. Nobody would wear a fur sweater like this one with heavy military slacks and knee-high leather boots during the spring or the summer. It just doesn't make sense. Why would you show a fur house collection in spring? Let it be a corresponding member of the haute couture schedule. And I think that this look and the 18 others are a good example of the evident lunacy going on at Fendi now. Next comes a halter style slip dress with keyhole cutout, and it seems pretty wearable except for the reflective sheer cape placed over it. It definitely makes the look a bit more elegant, but I did see a quote from Kim Jones that said, Quote, I have friends that just buy couture clothes and they don't buy big ball gowns. They buy real clothes, things that fit their bodies. Of course, clients can have their capes removed, but I do think it's a bit counterintuitive to what he said he wanted to create. Also, it doesn't make what looks like gorgeous embroidery easily visible, which is also a shame. A beige sheer gown is held together by tiny hexagons, which is a subtle yet lovely motif. On top of that, pearls sit at the center of each of the hexagons and a sheer halter bodysuit is seen underneath. On top of that, pearls sit at the center of each hexagon and a halter style bodysuit is seen underneath. Again, it seems strange that we are seeing gowns when I'm expecting real clothes, but I won't complain about this gown in particular. I will complain about the boots paired with it because the fact that they are so apparent at that level feels very awkward. Giving the look a simple pump could have easily avoided this dimensional issue. It's like a really bad case of color blocking nobody asked for. While the silk looks gorgeous and the embroidery at the bottom could be considered nice, this gown feels like it should be discussed in one of our Say Yes to the Dress bridesmaids videos, not an haute couture review. The construction of the gown is the real problem. The fabric flower, the gathering at the bust that creates awkward lines down the center, and that sad little bolero just doesn't feel like the smart or expensive Fendi we saw under both Carl and Sylvia. I feel like I could go pick this up from my local David's bridal and return it in seven days or less. It's just to mother of the bride, and not in a good way. The idea of menswear looks entering this collection was not really something I thought we'd see, but I guess that was a bit naive of me. But rest assured, Kim will only be doing Fendi women's wear from now on. But nothing about this black suit with asymmetrical lapel, fishnet sleeves, and hideous front slit pants are desirable, nor something I want to put my eyes through seeing again. A simple black lace gown is, well, just a black lace gown. With haute couture, if you're going to make the atelier crafts people spend countless hours on pieces like these, make it worth it, please, for their sake. You know, think of the crafts people. And those knee-high black boots also create such a weird focus on the bottom of the gown. And nude underwear? Could we not have just gone with black? I'm confused. A clean white gown is actually quite lovely. Its simple silhouette is accommodating and the subtle complexities of the braided sleeves are quite interesting. The embroidery of flowers that get heavier as we move closer to the hem is fine too. I guess this is like the best look of the collection, but like, Another sheer gown with keyhole cutout creates vertical stripes with gold embroidery. The high-low hem exposes embroidered boots, which to some may be attractive, but to me they look like blue waffle personified. A shimmering, marbling motif covers a suit jacket and wide leg pant, and a matching bag is attached. While Kim Jones might not be doing menswear at Fendi, his women's customers can rest assured that he probably will continue to explore suiting at the brand. I truly think the motif is downright hideous, but at least it's not an artist collaboration for once. The asymmetrical collar shirt has the same gold embroidery stripe technique from earlier, but it feels like it's trying to compensate rather than innovate. We are more than halfway through this collection, and can anybody honestly tell me they have felt something other than negative feelings about any of these looks thus far? or, you know, just melancholy. But like, positive vibes, I don't think we're getting. A half suit jacket, half pink embroidered gown arrives, and while I understand the theme is based around Orlando and gender bending, this is so on the nose. I feel Kim Jones must think we're all stupid or something. What about this is smart, intelligent, or even remotely wearable? Am I supposed to sit here and oogle the fact that this Project Runway level concept is on an haute couture runway? Cause I'm not, that's not what I'm gonna do. Listen, at least Maria 
Mary Grazia and Virginie make wearable clothing. Yeah, listen, I'm using them as good examples here. And well, with looks like these that are so rudimentary yet haughty, Kim has fallen to the bottom of the haute couture totem pole. I mean, Jesus, give us a goddamn break. Something interesting, please. The next look is in the rule of threes. One third coat with vertical gold embroidery, one third tunic with delicate floral motifs, and one third embroidered gown of no consequence. Instead of trying to make gimmicky looks like this, that embroidered coat could have actually been beautiful if cut correctly on a model. The tunic gown could have also been interesting, albeit a little bit basic, and that other embroidered gown, well, that we could just let that die. We're good, we'll, you know. They call it the cutting room floor for a reason, Kim. But honestly, this like annoys the shit out of me. That beautiful suit jacket would have been gorgeous and yet I don't know what it would look like completed. Another halter slip gown emerges and it's full of cutouts that are embroidered with little crosses which create beautiful intricacies. I think it's maybe the fabric and the slight wrinkling that makes me not go the full 100 on it, but I do think it's a great style I hope will be explored in the future. Fur is finally back, as fur at Fendi is the only house I clamor to see the textile at. Karl Lagerfeld turned Fendi, a slightly stodgy Roman fur house, into a fun and frivolous brand that explored fur in non-conventional ways. And while this full fur flower coat is definitely an exploration, and one that is quite realistic at that, I hope that Kim can actually bring joy to this house. I mean, let's be real. You're working with dead animals. Make them exciting or otherwise, what was the point of skinning them? I understand Kim was looking at haute couture from a British perspective, but I think that's a cheap cop out. McQueen and Galliano were both British and well, they never made work that was this banal. The marbling continues and is probably a reference to Fendi's Roman and Italian roots. Marble is an Italian export staple and the history of ancient Roman marble are very deep, which makes this look in a graphic sense a nice nod to the brand's history. But to be honest, Silvia Venturini Fendi did it better during her fall 2019 collection. The suit doesn't seem to flatter here. The jacket seems oversized and in a not good way, while the way the pants fall is flat, like a stale soda. And nothing about that semi-sheer cape is helping to elevate this look or collection. It feels gimmicky at best, which I just think at this point, this whole collection is a gimmick. The next marble suit actually fits better, but it doesn't have sleeves, so that might be a helpful element. The cape also sits nicely on the shoulders and has a sort of Roman emperor feel to the full style. But the pants, they're just gross. The way the seams descend down the pants are just awkward, and then the way they're split open does nada for the rest of the look, and just makes the shoes look like dirty ballet slippers. I don't understand how he could fuck up tailoring so bad. It's sort of the only thing he has going for him. A fur floral robe in theory is nice, but it runs a bit more friar tuck with a decadent love of fur rather than a chic coat everybody would fight to the death on the Fendi sales floor for. Kim, keep silhouettes like these in the monastery for now. Thank you. Peace be with you. As much as I love the connection of this lace halter and the sleeves, this peachy gown it's attached to with its asymmetrical beading and beaded waist, is, it's just hideous. It's truly so hard to ignore. And again, it's been ball gown after ball gown. Where are the actual wearable pieces? And do bring out the ones that look like they cost $50,000, please, because I think you'll have a hard time finding buyers for such drivel like this. I'm having to figure out new words to describe how bad this collection is. That's that's when you know it's rough. A lovely caped gown in a black and copper actually has a gorgeous silhouette, but it's ruined by the beaded waist, which makes the area between the under bust and the placement of the beaded waist a really awkward gray zone. It's like the Bermuda Triangle, you just get lost there. I will say the cape fits lovely on the shoulders and seeing a tiny bit of a mermaid cut is great, but again, it's nothing groundbreaking, which is this whole collection. Finally, a silver and gray reflective marble gown with bad but long cape closes out the show. Nothing about it is flattering, well-designed, or interesting. And this is where my issue is. While it's great to see Naomi Campbell close the show, we've seen it from Kim before. Remember his last Louis Vuitton collection? I've been waiting for Kim to stop hiding behind artist collaborations because those prove nothing about his ability to actually design things. This first haute couture collection shows, to me at least, that the emperor has no clothes. If you want to call Kim the Steve Jobs of fashion because he makes a lot of great products but isn't much of a designer, be my guest. But 
Calling him a designer? This is a great example of why I refuse to. It's almost a slight to every designer who actually puts time and effort into their work. The biggest slight of all is that he was given this job. There are countless young designers who could actually bring a joy and vibrancy to Fendi. They wouldn't stick their uber famous model friends from the 1990s in their shows. And then they also would not try to shove their ill-equipped model children down our throats. That's a really big one for me. From the Fendi haute couture of Sylvia Venturini Fendi to this, I almost feel betrayed. It's like a two. Brute. See, my Roman influences. But with that, that is the end of our haute couture reviews. I hope you guys enjoyed and please let me know what some of your favorite and least favorite collections were this whole season. So I will see you guys on the next one and TTYL.